morning to all of you. Thank you for coming to this. Uh, um, yeah, what was the title originally was uh, I had I gave this talk once in FRE and we gave the title Fusion for Lawyers. And then uh, Leban put it as Fusion for Non-Physicists. I don't know. I mean, maybe it's just a simple or I try to give a simple explanation about uh, fusion. And it's not just ITER. It's a little bit more than that. Um, and if you don't understand me, if you don't understand what I'm saying, uh, I mean, it's my fault, OK? It is, uh, it is clear by definition. You know, Einstein said, if you cannot explain it in simple terms, it's because you haven't understood it. And understanding fusion, in fact, I cannot claim that I've understood it. There are some phenomena in fusion that I don't think anyone really understands. One of which is quantum dynamics, quantum electrodynamics, and quantum physics. Uh, some of the phenomena that we observe in, in nuclear fusion cannot be explained by classical mechanics. And I don't think there is anyone that understands the mystery of quantum physics. This is one uh, essential issues fusion. But um, yeah, let me get going. And then I will see if there are questions. And if there are questions after this talk, I think it would be interesting to have them from you in writing so that we can improve the next version of the talk. So this is a picture of showing the sun and where Earth is. And you can, it can give you an impression of the size of the sun. The sun is the closest fusion reactor that we have to Earth. It's what generates all the energy that we use. So even, even the chemical energy that we get out of hydrocarbons comes originally from fusion that occur on the sun. So we just try here to reproduce, we say, the nuclear reaction that goes on the sun, on Earth. Yes, it's true this, but up to a certain point, because the nuclear reaction that goes on the sun is quite different from the fusion reaction that we will try to reproduce in ITER. There, is, there are some yeah, quantitative uh, differences which are quite substantial. The, the reason why uh, the fusion reaction can go on the sun is because of its size. So, so this is why I shown this picture. It's just its sheer size that creates a, a gravitational force which is so high so that at the core of the sun, some conditions occur which would otherwise not be possible on Earth. And these conditions allow the formation of, of plasmas and the formation of, uh, yes, you know, a, a mix, a mix called plasma is the fourth state of matter. We, we are familiar with solids, with fluids, with gas, and then there is plasma. Plasma is actually what composes most of the universe. So actually solids are particular uh, state of matter. The most common state of matter is plasma. And plasma is where the atoms are broken down between nuclei and electrons. So there are ions, which are part of the nucleus, and electrons. It's a bit of a soup, let's say. So there are many types of plasmas uh, in the universe. And we have two important qualities that we have to matter. Mm -hmm. Density, it's okay. I don't think I need to explain more what density is. And temperature. Temperature is a form of uh, energy contained in, uh, in matter. It is energy that results from uh, random motion. It is measured in the form of uh, energy, in energy units but it is specific for random motion. So we use the word temperature in ether. Ether, we say that it means the way. It means actually not exactly the way. If, you know, in the study, Latin that I studied, the way in Italian is la via. The way in Latin it's la via, it's not ether. Ether is, is say, the, the journey. But the original name, ITER, didn't mean the journey. It meant International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. Then one day, 2003 or four, the negotiators thought that this was not really very useful politically. So 
we had to invent another another explanation of the name because they wanted to keep the name. But thermonuclear, it means that there is a nuclear reaction that comes as a consequence of temperature, which is, say, random agitation of plasmas. So we have different type of plasmas, and lightning is one that you are familiar uh, of. It's the typical plasma that happens on Earth. Otherwise, on Earth, there are not really so many plasma that occur. We need, uh, say, to occur nuclear fusion. You see the solar core, extremely high density to have on the sun the fusion reaction that fuels the sun itself. Very high. The core, in the core, we have this plasma, the plasma that has a density which is much higher than any solid on Earth. It's about 100 times, say, in the order of 100 times the density of water. So take into account that the most dense solid on Earth, say gold or iridium, they have a density which is 20 times water. So in the, in the, in the, in the uh, core sun, the density is much higher. We cannot really achieve such densities on Earth, not stably. We can have explosions, and that's one way on how we can exploit thermonuclear fusion on Earth. Inertial fusion, for example, they can compress very high density for a very transient moment or even you know bombs but we cannot do it we cannot achieve such high density we don't know how to achieve such high density continuously and as i will show you if we would be able to do that and we would be really able to reproduce the exact nuclear reaction that goes on the sun it would actually be useless we'll show you this later okay so let's move on uh, few numbers about the sun so that you understand a little bit more. We have uh, a density on the surface because their gravity is much, much less, which is similar to the density that you have, uh, say, you know, in gas, let's say. We have a central density on the other hand, which is 150 grams per cubic centimeter. So it's eight times gold, which is 160 times 150 times the one of water. Another feature of the sun is that it is so big that the energy takes a very long time to, um, yes, to leave the core and reach the edge of the sun. So if something happens in the core of the sun, before you see it on the surface, it takes a very long time. It takes, say, millions of years, in fact. And then it takes yeah, a few minutes for the energy to reach Earth. So these are the typical parameters that you can see and you have seen before an image of, uh, uh, of different size. Now, by the way, the sun is, is a medium star, a medium sized star. There are stars which are much, much bigger. And there are stars that have different type of fuels. So it's not, they are not all the same, let's see. So this is the, the, the chain, it's called the proton-proton the chain. This is what happens in most of the sun. Don't get you know, confused with this. But the fundamental thing that happens in the sun is that two protons, which are, uh, say, the, 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 uh, the nuclei of hydrogen, of plain hydrogen, fuse. It would be wonderful if we would do this on Earth because there is plenty of hydrogen. This, it turns out, it's a very, very difficult reaction to occur. But it happens in the sun. Okay, I think I made it clear to you. There is, fortunately, uh, there are some other ways to have fusion. And where we get an energy yield, where we get energy out. And one of them is, you have heard many times, from deuterium and tritium. Deuterium and tritium are two isotopes. It means two different type of forms of hydrogen. Deuterium uh, occurs in nature, naturally, and there is a, yeah, one, one nucleus every so many thousands of hydrogen is deuterium. And in deuterium, a proton is also coupled with a neutron, and deuterium is more rare, and it's also unstable. It doesn't really like to be. It wants to suicide. And tritium typically has a suicidal rate of about 12 years. 
So if you take a bunch of, of tritia, of tritiums, uh, you know, every, after 12 years, they will be half. Half will have suicided. It means they don't really like their form. But what is, for some reason, uh, <clears throat> working out better is that tritium and deuterium, they are much easier to fuse. So I will try to give a little bit of information just to give you an image of what does it mean difficult to fuse, what does it mean easy to fuse, because I think uh, that you should understand a little bit more. There is a, 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 a function here called the reactivity. Reactivity, I'm not going to get into details of what physically it means, but you, just the name of it, <laughs> can give you a bit of an, of an understanding. And there is a very, very fundamental difference uh, of very fundamental difference between the reactivity of deuterium and tritium and proton proton. So this is a view I, I spoke to you a little bit before about the sun. This is a view of how the sun works. The nuclear reactor in the sun is in the core. It's not the whole sun that uh, has fusion going on, mostly in the core. But the temperature is about 15 million degrees. It's going to, it's a little bit less, it's actually one-tenth of what we will achieve in ether. But again, with very, very high density. So this is where the reaction takes place, and then there is the physics of the sun, which is, of course, very, very complicated. But fundamentally, it gets really hot because of the power it produces. But surprisingly, and I think this is something that uh, I, would, I would like you to remember, the power density which is generated in the core of the sun is very small. So there is a, say, something called power density. It means how much power is produced in a unit of volume. So we produce power per unit of volume. Our body, we are warm. And we are warm because we have to work, we have to, to be alive. So there is a certain amount of energy that we produce, chemical energy, there are chemical reactions in our body that produce some heat. And we have a power density in our body which is uh, roughly in the same order of magnitude of the one that, which is in the core of the sun. This is very surprising because we are not really very hot, are we? So the power density is enough to keep us at 36 centigrade even when it's a little bit cold. But it's relatively modest. So how does it get so hot? It gets so hot because it's so big. It is again because of that. Because it takes so much time to get the energy from its core to the edge that it gradually gets so hot. That is the fundamental reason. But it's also the fundamental reason while if we would be able to get proton-proton reaction and reproduce what goes on in the sun, we would have a reactor which is basically useless. Because it would have to be so big, we would have to make a reactor which is as big as a mountain to produce any usable energy. We cannot really get much use of temperatures in the order of, say, 30, 40 centigrade, maybe to, to warm our houses. But cannot really produce effectively electricity. So <coughs> this is why the nuclear reaction that goes on on the sun, it's different from the one we will try to produce because of the fuel types, the reactivity is totally different. Power density, I will come back to power densities later, the power density that happen in a fusion reactor, the one that we will try to achieve, is about one megawatt, one million watts per cubic meter. The power density we have in our body, similar to the sun, is, is uh, 100 watts. So it's 10,000 time, 10, times different. Fire is about one megawatt per cubic meter. Just fire. Coal, coal, coal fire, about one megawatt per cubic meter. So the sun is actually a reactor which is quite, quite soft in terms of reactivity but it's very big. So, now this is another plot which is of interest, which um, tells you, in essence, 
what is the intrinsic energy of a nucleus versus its uh, mass number. So there are, in, in nature, there are light nuclei, like hydrogen is the lightest. There are very heavy nuclei, for example, uranium. Uranium has more than 90 protons, has 235 uh, between protons, and it's a very big nucleus. It weights 235 times the one of hydrogen. Now, in nature, uh, we know that when a nucleus is, is very light, when nuclei are very light, if they fuse, if you put them together, if you get them close enough, they will fuse and they will generate some energy. Energy in the form of kinetic motions of the particle that result out of this reaction. Conversely, if an element is very heavy and you try to fuse them, they will need an energy to fuse. So one of the great mysteries, well, there are explanations for that, is how the heck did we get uh, heavy atoms in the first place? How come? Because if everything started, or if everything starts in the core of suns on fusion of protons, which fuse and then form helium, and then helium fuse and fuse and fuse, if they keep doing like this at some point, they would produce no more energy. And in fact, within the stars, you don't find anything which is heavier than iron. Iron is uh, an element where above iron, fusion stops. It doesn't come naturally anymore. The explanation is on how we get heavier elements in planets is essentially the thinking of astrophysicists is that there are phenomena called supernova. Supernova is an explosion that occurs at the end of the life of a star. The phenomena behind this is very complicated, and I really don't understand it, by the way. But as a consequence of this huge uh, energy available, there is the fusion of elements that produce also heavier elements that we also use on Earth, but not in the sun. So. In, uh, in physics, we, have, we, have, we study that we have four fundamental forces. So there are also uh, works in order to unify these forces. But in one scheme of physics, there are four fundamental forces. There is gravity, there is the electromagnetic force, there is the strong interaction and the weak interaction. The strong interaction and the weak interactions are forces which are essential to keep the nuclei together. They explain why the nucleus is together. The one which are more familiar with is gravity. I think you are familiar with gravity. This is what keeps us down. This is what keeps, uh, yes, bodies, bodies attracted to each other. And it's always a, an attractive force. There is no gravity that pulls you away. Two bodies attract to each other. Earth and me, we attract each other, and that's why you know, we are getting closer. And this is true for everybody. Then there are different ways to see this. Sometimes you say, okay, the general relativity speaks about the curvature of space. But okay, if we speak about forces, this is gravity. The other important force that we are familiar with is electromagnetic force. And say, maybe you know what happens if uh, you, say you charge some plastic, or I don't know if any of you have ever seen these experiments where somebody is put on an electric platform, high voltage platform in your hair, sort of straighten up. Uh, this is because of forces that occur between charged particles. The charged particles are electrons and protons, the ones that we are familiar with. Electrons are charged negatively, protons are charged positively. This is how we call them. It's not that they have, if you look at them, they have a plus. By the way, we speak about particles and balls and so on. In reality, the reality of things is very different from the way I'm explaining. The reality of things is that all of what we call particles in reality are not particles, are sort of waves and quanta. So if we would be able to see inside, we wouldn't really see all these billiard balls. But say, in order for us to have a model that we can understand better, otherwise we will not be able to understand, because we would not have anything to relate to, we call particles 
we, we, we think about them as billiard balls. So we have electrons and protons, <coughs> and it turns out that in fusion we want to get two protons, for example, this is what happens in the sun, to stick together. The trouble is that they don't really like that at all. If you get them close, they will repel, because two particles with the same charge repel, and repel very strongly. So the amount of force that particles, two particles, exert on each other uh, by the force called the electromagnetic force is much, much bigger than gravity. Gravity doesn't work for two particles. Well, there is, but it's very, very small. Gravity works when you have a lot of them, when we have big masses. When you go to this very small, then the electromagnetic force is dominant until they get really, really close to each other. When they really get very close, they, they can stick. You can imagine that there is a glue. So you just have to get them to touch. And then they will stick. But you have to get them to touch. And that's the challenge. The challenge that we have to do in some simple terms is to get the uh, nuclei of deuterium and tritium to touch. They will not really touch. But see, there is because they are not billiard balls, but say in our image, we can, see it, we can see it like that. So there is something called the Coulomb barrier. Coulomb because the force, the electromagnetic force, is the electrostatic force was first formulated by a gentleman called Coulomb. And you can imagine, you look in the picture in the right, you can imagine that in order to get these two particles to fuse, you have to get them above a certain hill. You know, they really don't want, so if you throw them to each other with sufficient velocity, they will reach the top of the hill, and then, tuck, they will, they will fuse. Okay, this is a bit the image that you can, you can stick to your mind to. Now, here it's where it gets really funny, because if we take, we do some very simple calculation, and we see the amount of energy that two nuclei would have to have in order, or to say the temperature, the matter should have, plasma should have in order to get fusion, it is very, very high. We get that for a DT reaction, for example, we would have to reach 3 billion degrees. But you have heard that either will operate at 150 million. So it's bigger, 3 billion, it's bigger. And in the sun, it's 10 billion degrees. And in reality, I told you that in the sun, the temperature is it's only 15 million degrees. So there is some funny, funny phenomena. The funny phenomena is that there is a phenomena in physics, which is say, the result of quantum physics, which is called the tunnel effect. So you, in your image, you have to imagine that these two hills, these two red hills, there are some imaginary tunnels. And there is a probability that the particles will go through these tunnels. This is a phenomena which I think it's very difficult to understand. I repeat, nobody understands quantum physics. Nobody on the, on the world, in the world. There are a lot of people that understand general relativity, which is very complicated, but nobody really understands quantum physics. It's magic. There is something magic that happens in the very small. And this magic, it's good, because it allows us to get two particles to fuse, at a lower energy. So only 150 million degrees would be necessary. So here it is, uh, see, some bullets, which uh, I try to put here about the, uh, say, the basis of tunnel effects, which is a fundamental, uh, say, physical phenomena, quantum electrodynamics is a fundamental physical phenomena that allow us allows to, us to explain what happens in the sun. But I will not get and dwell in this. Another phenomena that another physical, um, yes, uh, physical quantity which is of interest in fusion, it's called the cross-section. So I spoke about the reactivity before. I will speak about something very related to that. It's the cross-section. It gives you an idea and it's interpreted in, in, in the form of a target area, it gives you an idea on what is the likelihood that two particles collide with each other. Okay, so 
when particles, how easy it is that they stick together. So that is the fusion cross-section. So this is where we have a very big, big difference in the cross-section between a proton-proton reaction and the deuterium-tritium reaction. So the most probable, again, fusion reaction that we can do, it's between deuterium and tritium. And this is why we are trying to do that. But there are some others. There are some other fusion reactions that we can take, take care of, but they are a little bit more complicated. Proton-proton is really, really complicated. So we won't even attempt that. Then I discussed with you before that there is another, you know, physical phenomena which is to our advantage, and that is when a very heavy element uh, splits, it generates energy. And there are some elements which are very easy to break. They are very close to being unstable. So it's enough to have to kick them, to touch them with a very modest energy and they will split. And they will generate a lot of energy. So how can you imagine this? You can imagine in your mind like having two parts that are glued together, but there is a very power, powerful spring that would like to take them apart. And if you touch them, if you give them a little kick, that will be enough to break this bond of the glue and poof, off it goes. In fact, the strong, electroma, strong um, uh, say, uh, interaction, which is what keeps uh, the nucleus together, the force vector is called gluon. So the glue is a good, is a good um, image that you can have. So we are very lucky because some elements like uranium 235, 235 between protons and neutrons are inside the nucleus of uranium. It's enough to have very little energy. So you can have, this is what Fermi did, he figured out that we could have a chain reaction. Because chain reaction means that out of this fission reaction, there are two fission products, two parts, and then there are, in average, two and a half neutrons, see, sometimes three, sometimes two, that are generated. And if you can use one of these neutrons to kick another nucleus and get going, there you go. You can produce energy with very little initial input. So it's very easy, in fact, to get it going, but well, very easy, maybe too much, uh, not too easy, but uh, see, uh, Fermi managed to have uh, in his so-called Fermi pile, um, a self-sustained nuclear chain reaction. It was a very simple device. It was enough, well, let's put it in very simple terms, it was enough to put enough matter, enough fissile material in a certain volume so that the neutrons which are generated by fission would have sufficient probability to hit another nucleus to get the reaction going. It was very simple. And in fact, uh, fission, the, the, the use of fission in such simple way was what led then to the development of, of, uh, of nuclear power. Eight decades after the atomic pile, we have, you know, about five, almost 500 power reactors. We have a lot in the Navy also. We have a lot of ideas on how to utilize this, this uh, physical reaction. And I think there are more coming, eh, by the way. We ended up, uh, and I think this is an important concept, we ended up using two prevalent type of reactors. This is called uh, uh, boiling. A water reactor and pressurized water reactor, and most actually a pressurized water reactor, because of simplicity. Actually, the pressurized water reactor, which is the one that dominates the world, uh, is very simple and it got it developed so much also because originally in the Navy they thought that this was the one that was the simplest to implement. Uh, yes, in a submarine or in an uh, aircraft carrier, because this is where they immediately saw that, uh, you know, the advantage of nuclear power would be immense, because you would be able to 
you know, run a submarine for many years. So they can stay underwater without surfacing. Otherwise, we would have to surface, you know. The submarine that run on, uh, on diesel, they have to surface to charge the battery, and then they can go underwater. They cannot otherwise run diesel engine underwater. They need oxygen from air. So, so that's where the development came from, from submarines, and it developed then further. And, you know, even the EPR, uh, it's a pressurized water reactor. But I want to say that from my perspective, there are many other ideas to utilize nuclear fission, which may be a little bit more complicated, a little bit more expensive, and also provide a lot of interesting safety features. So, from my perspective, when you hear some people saying, oh, fission is dangerous, or fission is uh, producing a lot of waste, well, I don't know about that. It is the way that we utilize fission. The elements that we start with, which is uranium-235, is a radioactive material, is unstable. You don't want to have a lot of uranium-235 in your refrigerator, let's say, and you find it in nature. And what comes out of this simple reaction are fission products, and they are also radioactive, many of them. But the radiotoxicity of the products of a fission reactor of a fission reaction after, say, two or three hundred years is less than the original uranium we started from. Much of what we speak about waste is because we generate waste and we don't use so much of the fuel in the first place. Only a very small amount of fuel uh, in a fission, in a light water reactor, say, is used. Only two percent, three percent. After a while, it's no, no, no longer economical. But this is to say that there is, I think, in nuclear power, a lot of future also in, in fission. And I don't believe personally that fusion will replace fission. I don't think so. I think in, in time, we will learn how to use them together. But this maybe it's uh, separate. Okay, this is a bit of a summary. So now I speak about power densities. Before I spoke about the sun core, 250 watts per cubic meter, which is similar again to our body. Our body is, uh, depends, you know, depends uh, what we are doing. If we are sleeping, if we are running, can be a lot of difference in the amount of power we generate, but it's in the same order. We are, say, about 50 watts, it's the power. But interestingly is, um, you see the difference in power density. In a light water reactor, in the fuel element, we have a huge power generated, five gigawatt per cubic meter. So 5,000 times power density than the one we have in the, for example, in the core of ether. Thousands of times more. Uh, coal, burning coal, a few megawatts per cubic meter. Likewise, for um, DT reaction in, in demo, it depends a bit on the magnetic field. We can, we, can, we can tweak it a little bit, but it's not so much different than about one megawatt per cubic meter. Amongst living, uh, living bodies, the one that produces more power per cubic meter is the hummingbird. You can figure this out, you know. They really have spent a lot of energy just flying and staying still. They're very inefficient. In fact, they have to eat all the time. They have to eat sugar all the time just to get, us fly, get them flying. But this is a remarkable power density of 50 kilowatt. Human body, one kilowatt per cubic meter. Okay, so the closest to the sun is actually manure. It's, you have a pile of manure, you see it's fuming. The chemical reaction that occurs there, the oxidation that takes place there, gives about the same power density. So, question that I said, I mentioned before, what would we do if we would be able to reproduce the fusion reaction that goes on the sun? We wouldn't do much with it, because the power density that we have, it's too small. And we need, in order to use energy efficiently, we need to get the temperature up. If we don't get the temperature up, we cannot uh, produce it. I can maybe spend some words later on explaining why. Conversely, if the sun would be fueled by deuterium and tritium, I think this would mean, uh, you know, 
a quick end to Earth because the power change that would be generated would be so high, so quickly, that it would explode. The, the sun would blow up. That would be too much. So now, how do we get nuclear fusion on Earth? Thermonuclear, nuclear fu uh, thermonuclear fusion. So, um, we need to find a way to get the nuclei together. That's how, that's what we have to do. We have to get, get them compressed together. But this is a plasma. So, the plasma has to be very hot. So, how do we do that? Again, the sun is gravity that makes sure this is possible. And on Earth, there is the physics phenomena that goes on on nuclear bombs. Nuclear bombs is a dynamic phenomena. So it is basically compression. I'm not going to go into nuclear bombs naturally, but there are two um, paths that have been, uh, say, pursued and are being pursued uh, on Earth. One is so-called inertial fusion, and the other is magnetic confinement. Magnetic confinement, we use magnetic field. But let's look first at inertial confinement. There was a very interesting talk from Felicity um, uh, Albert. Uh, she is a scientist from the Livermore, uh, Lawrence Livermore, where there is the biggest facility in the world to study inertial fusion. Maybe some of you have heard this talk. It was very interesting. And she describes this in... Uh, in uh, much more detailed than, than I do, than I will do. But the principle is that we take a particle of ice, essentially, made with uh, deuterium and tritium, and, and then we increase the temperature on the surface of this particle by means of an external energy source, and we increase it so much that this particle implodes. It has really to get very hot on the surface, and there is an implosion. This implosion is then creating conditions in the center of this particle, of this, say, speck. It's a bit like, uh, you know, uh, I would say, uh, a speck of, of sugar. Uh, sesame seed. See, this is the size of the particles that is being used. So that at the core, at the center of the core of, the, of this particle, fusion conditions occur. Seems very smart. Uh, the trouble is that it's not so easy. Uh, it's not so easy because, okay, there are very powerful uh, lasers which have been utilized, are being utilized, for example, in, the, in Lawrence Livermore. There is also a facility here in France. Uh, called laser megajoule. Laser megajoule, because this is the energy that is generated by this fusion reaction about megajoule. I will come to that, but see, it gets very high compression, stronger than the one you have in the sun, in fact. Uh, the example is that you would be able to get something the size of the thing in the left, which is a bolt, something which is on the, on the right. Imagine that you want to compress something, you have to compress something so much, you have to apply a pressure, a condition on the surface which is very uniform. Otherwise, it would shape and will break, it will not compress like that. That's their difficulty. That's the difficulty of research in inertial fusion, the biggest one. So there is a way which is called direct drive and a way which is called the indirect drive. Direct drive means you just shoot the laser directly on this spec. It has a higher efficiency, but it's much less stable. There is another invention which is called the indirect drive, where lasers are shot on a, on a little um, chamber with some holes made of gold. It's perfectly made, and by some, um, say, reactions that occur of these laser beams on the matter. There is a conversion from laser to X-rays, and X-rays are better suited to compress. I would say that this is a, you know, it's a even more complex a system. 
So you see an image of, of this little chamber that I spoke about before. And each one of this chamber is uh, costing a lot of money, takes a lot of time to make. You have to set it up precisely. Takes maybe one day or two days or the order of days to have one experiment. And when you do one experiment, this is what happened in the Livermore, you generate megajoule of power. What is megajoule? Megajoule is the energy which is, say, in a, in a pizza. So, okay, it's important eh? because we can get going with that. But if you have a reactor that makes a pizza every few days, it's not very useful. So the big challenge for inertial fusion is to get this where you can have, you know, hundreds of pizzas every second. Then we start talking about having something useful. Because you have to get, if you want to get 500 megawatt, it means you have to get 500 megajoule every second. Megawatts is a unit of power, joule is energy. So, Peter will produce uh, thermonuclear power in the range of 500 megajoule every second. So, then it's okay. So, so the challenge here is that the good thing is that they managed to get it going. And I think they will improve, I am sure. But there is a very long way for inertial fusion to get to a power reactor. Part, in fact, of the interest in inertial fusion, you may have heard, is because of defense. They get a lot of money from defense because it allows uh, them to study thermonuclear phenomena which are much closer to the ones that would occur in a weapon. Now, it's not possible because of treaties to have thermonuclear uh, experimentation. So this is, uh, say, with bombs. So this is one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why they get some funding. Uh, I think it, it's, I'm not going to get into detail also because, you see, these photographs are, are a little bit old, but they show their, their, the type of lasers and the size of the laser room, you know, in order to get this megajoule. By the way, you need, you know, thousands of times more energy that goes into the laser. Then eventually these lasers are converted into X-rays and they get ignition. But ignition for, the, for uh, inertial fusion, the term ignition means that a little bit less than what came out was put in this spec. Ignition for magnetic fusion means Q equal infinity. It's a little bit different. Okay, just for your knowledge. And what you see there is the vessel the vessel of uh, laser mega of uh, so the NIF when it was installed, I think it was 25 years ago. So now I move to magnetic confinement. And magnetic confinement, we have, well, there are some other solutions, but say the two principal type of geometries that we are thought, one is toroidal and the other is like a bottle, the magnetic bottle called the mirror. We have to get a plasma, we can get a plasma, we have to get it in, in a chamber, and we have to make sure it doesn't touch the wall. And we want to do it in a steady way, to, not to touch the wall, because if it would touch the wall, it would immediately cool down. And we have to get it very hot. So we use magnetic fields in one form or another. These are the geometries that you see, you see in many devices. So there are some called the stellarators, Okay, there is one called Fenderstein 7X, which is, I think, to my knowledge, the largest stellarator now in operation, which is in the north of Germany. And there are other ideas to make other stellarators. And then we have the tokamak. I will not discuss how the tokamak works today. There will be another uh, tokamaks for, uh, for lawyers another time. I think it's interesting. It's not so complicated, after all. It's complicated to get it to the conditions we want but it's not that complicated to understand why and what are the principles of this different magnetic confinement system. They have some peculiarities, but you see the main components, the main components being the toroidal field magnet, the one that creates a field that runs along the torus, and then we have the, the ring coils that create a field which is on the plane, of, on the vertical plane, 
and uh, the two combined create this, uh, together with the plasma current, create a spiral field. But I think I won't get into this because you would just get confused, uh, and it deserves a special, a special session. But what is very important is that we have to get something called confinement working. We have to get this gas, this plasma, sorry, far from the wall, this hot plasma far from the wall, we have to get it very hot in the center, and we use, as I will show you, some means to get it hot in the center. And then we have to make sure that the center gets hot. And in order to get hot, you need something called confinement. It's like for you when you go in bed. You go in bed, if outside it's cold, you want a lot of blankets. So you want to make sure it takes a longer time for the heat that you generate to escape. This is energy confinement time. You hear it sometimes when we speak about nuclear reactors. So what is the energy confinement time? We need to get a certain energy confinement time. Otherwise, we won't get it hot enough. And if we don't get it hot enough, we are not going to get enough nuclear fusion reactions. Because to get fusion reactions, as I explained before, you remember the curve about the reactivity, we have to get to a point where the reactivity is high enough. It only happens when the particles are in average hot enough, energetic enough. So the big challenge about uh, magnetic confinement is how to get all these blankets that you see here in different colors well aligned to each other in such a way that energy will remain for a longer time in the core. There must be order. And what in the 80s people thought, in the 70s people thought, calculated, was that everything would have been done and dusted with a machine the size of jet. But it turned out that something against us, I think some people suspected this, but it uh, uh, turned out that something against us worked, worked in nature, which is called turbulence. Tur turbulence is what basically generate some uh, perturbations in this beauty, that beautiful shape that you see in, in the left that make sure that the heat flux uh, escapes from the core with a faster rate that would otherwise be the case if everything would neat and tidy. And uh, say limiting turbulence, uh, particularly at the edge, is one of the reasons why we have so many scientists working around the world, which is essentially the challenge of getting energy confinement time high enough without going to a big size. So let me speak about size a little bit more. Okay. I spoke about pizza before. I'll speak about pizza now for another reason. So energy confinement time, it's something which can be achieved by having something big. You make it big, you increase the energy confinement time. And I take the pizza analogy because there are some interesting uh, equivalents in power density, and I would like to also to put to you another consideration. So you cannot really make a mini pizza oven. You know, to make a pizza, you need about 300 centigrade. That's the temperature that you should have in the oven. Otherwise, it doesn't really taste very good, you know. Any of you should know that, that if you cook at home, 200 centigrade is not a good temperature. 300 is the good one. 100, no good at all. <laughs> so you have to get it hot. Can you do a mini pizza oven? Like a little pizza oven, like when you, a little pizzette? Can't do that. Can't do that. You cannot get the temperature high enough. You put some wood sticks inside, doesn't get hot. Likewise, imagine when you have a bonfire. A bonfire gets really hot because it's big. The sun gets really hot because it's big, even though if the power dense. This is energy confinement time. It gets hot because energy confinement time improves with size. So the easiest thing to do is to make things bigger, in theory, because things bigger are complex to make, of course. And in tokamaks, you can make them bigger in size or you can increase the magnetic fields. The magnetic field makes equivalent size, linear size, say by increasing the field, you can make things a little bit smaller. There are complexities because there is a problem of power density. So what is interesting about fusion? Power is generated in a volume. 
But it's not, you have to get the power out. You have to get at some point the power out to produce electricity, to get steam and, and so on. So while in a coal power station, you can have the fire and you can put the coolant, the coolant heat exchanger pretty much inside the fire, you can mix it. You can't do that in fusion. In a, in a light water reactor, in fission, in a fission reactor, you can mix the coolant and the material that produce energy very much. You can have the fuel elements that are at gigawatt per cubic meter and next to it there is water. So, so you can get the heat out, you can cool it really efficiently. Can't do that in fusion. Cannot sort of put inside either a lot of pipes through the plasma because we wouldn't get it hot enough. We wouldn't be able to get the plasma hot enough. So we have the problem of, this is uh, the problem of scaling, the Godzilla problem. You know, Godzilla, if I would be, say, why Godzilla? I don't intend to be Godzilla, but say, if I would double my size, I would not be able to stand. I would collapse. Because if I double my size, my weight would become eight times, two times two times two, because every size is double. But, but my, the cross-section of my legs would become only four times, so everything would become heavier. And if I would become, you know, ten times, no way. I would not even be able to, to put me, you know, on my four legs, so to say. The same thing happens in fusion. If we double the size to get confinement, we have to pay attention about power density. So this is a very big challenge in fusion, is to get the size big enough by magnetic fields or just linear size so that we can get, we can get um, yes, the fusion reactions going. But at the same time, we have to face the fact that the power density at the edge can become very difficult to cope with. This is why we have so many difficulties and so much R&D that we have to overcome in all the tokamaks around the world about the diverter. You have heard about the diverter. The diverter is a place where the power density gets to the point where you have, say, 10 to 15, 20 megawatt per square meter. This is a power density you have in the nozzle of a rocket. Very, very high power density. And you cannot go up above that. You just are unable to design a heat exchanger that can cope with such a power density. So that is a bit the, the, the why. I mean, it takes so long, at least from my perspective. This is one of the fundamental reasons. Turbulence uh, required us to make things big. And as we make things big by magnetic fields or by size, we encounter the problem of power density. So to make this pizza oven, it's tricky. Because in order to get the conditions to make the pizza, we have to make it big. But as we make it big, from, a, from a, say, a thermomechanical standpoint, it gets complicated to build the oven itself. So that's what we essentially have to face. And this is what I have just explained along the way. Okay. So now one point I want to make is that how do we what I think, at least, because I think you will hear many opinions, what I think that will happen, is that I think that with ITER, that we, where we intend to demonstrate the scientific and technological feasibility of nuclear power, I think we will need some help. We need to develop the materials, and that there are, for example, IFMIF, it's a facility that is built for that end, because some of the materials need to resist to a lot of neutron flux, we will discuss this when we will speak about tokamaks a little bit more in detail. From my perspective, a lot of it will come from modeling. Problem C is that when you need to develop a research infrastructure which are big in order to work, they cost time and, and money. And you know what I mean. It takes time. But uh, modeling, computer modeling, is what allows us to understand what would happen in a different geometry. And I think this is what will happen. We are not there yet. We don't have computer models that allow to predict precisely what will happen in either. That's why we need to build it. But I believe that in 10, 20 years, 
there will be such computer models. That then we will be able to benchmark uh, with ITER, and then we will be able to design, I believe, things which hopefully will be a little bit simpler and possibly smaller. So that's the way I think this will develop in the future. So I spoke along the way a little bit about why we need it big, and I'll tell you this is what led ITER to be six meter. When we will have a talk about tokamaks, I will go more in detail, or somebody, maybe you talk, or somebody else will go more in detail to explain why is it six meter? Why not five? Five wouldn't work. Well, not at this magnetic field. And what led to the design of ITER? The fact that we want to have conditions which last with power density which are manageable. This is what led to this size. I spoke uh, briefly about other tokamaks before. The biggest now that just started the GD60SA, it gives you an idea on how ITER will be bigger than GD60SA. So GD60SA is the biggest, but look at how ITER magnets will be compared with it. This is really to get, again, the energy confinement time to the right level. You see a view inside the vessel of GD60SA. I think I have to come now to the end of my talk because time is up. And I would just like to thank you for coming today. Sorry that I think I should have done it maybe a little bit faster. Maybe next time I'll do better. And maybe there is not so much time for questions, but you can ask questions if you want uh, in writing. Uh, I don't know, Leban, if it's possible to have a way to. And that will also guide uh, not only in order to answer some of your questions, but also guide us to improve the presentation for next time. So we should try to make it clearer. Thank you again.